I'm Catherine Abeke, and I will be discussing a first step in Tanians and unification. My project advisor is Ms. Nakamura, and my committee members are Dr. Becerra and Dr. Jedek. So why Tanians, or in fact, why unification or string theory? Um, it's not intuitive at all to imagine the world with an eight-dimensional structure in our four-dimensional world. But it does become a little bit more apparent when we think of it in the context of string theory, which is a physics model that predicts nine spatial dimensions. Now, physics places great emphasis on theories that unify physical phenomena. It's been the theme ever since the 19th century. Um, James Clerk Maxwell, for instance, unified electricity and magnetism into one with electromagnetism. Albert, Albert Einstein unified the separate concepts of space and time into one with his special theory of relativity. And these unifications have always fixed inconsistencies that exist in separate theories. So unification is more necessary than optional. Now, the point of the unified theory is to unify all the forces, unify the gravitational force, electromagnetic, strong force, and the weak force. And we don't quite have one yet. String theory is a good candidate for it because it does unify all of these forces, but it hasn't been proven yet. Um, there have been experiments conducted to show that string theory physically works. And those experiments involve proving that we do actually have nine spatial dimensions. But so far, the way my fingers crossed, um, we haven't been able to prove that those extra dimensions do exist. So how is it possible that we have six extra spatial dimensions we didn't know about. We say we know that we can move left, right, back, forth, and up, down. Um, right now, the extra dimensions are suspected to be compact spaces curled up so tight that they are not observable to us. And theoretically, they've been shown to escape detection in low energy experiments, which is why all the experiments to prove that these extra dimensions exist that would prove string theory have, <clears throat> excuse me, have involved bombarding particles with high energies. So we're gonna like discuss this by thinking about one compact, one um, spatial dimension, first of all. Just because it's more simpler to do. So imagine we live in a world with only one spatial dimension. And as you walk along, you observe that the scenery repeats every time you walk a distance of two pi r for some r. And in fact, not only the scenery repeats, but the, the events that happen at the scene, such as like meeting your friend, Monkey D. Luffy. Um, so if you can see ahead, you will observe clones of Luffy repeating down the line at distances of 2 pi r, 4 pi r, 6 pi r, and so on. And if you look up the line, you can see the same thing as well. Now, the only way that we can describe this strange phenomenon is if we instead think of the line as a circle. So a circle with a circumference of t pi r. Um, in Luffy isn't, so Luffy isn't actually repeated every distance of t pi r. Instead, you are just coming back to the same point in the circle. So we do this um, using an identification so that, let's say, this is a point x. If we add t pi r to it and end up here, that's the same point x. Um, so we call this interval from 0 to 2 pi r, or fundamental domain, for the identification. And we can simply join these points, the two endpoints, together, and we'll get our circle, our compact dimension. Now, this is the same story in more than one dimension. Um, we can choose to apply an identification to compactify only one dimension. We can do it to two dimensions, as many as we want. And in our world, we're saying that we live in a world with six compact extra dimensions. 
Now we go on to discuss the quaternions. The quaternions satisfy I squared plus J squared equals K squared equals negative one. It's a four-dimensional algebra, so that I times J is K, J times K is I, and so on. I times K is negative J, J times I is negative K, and so on. Um, here we give a little multiplication table for it, and we use Q1, Q2, Q3 instead of YJK, just to respect that different notation does exist. Now for the postulates for the set of Italians under addition, you can see it's exactly the same as what we have for real numbers, because the Italians are also a division algebra. For multiplication, um, there are some slight changes. The algebra is no longer associative. It is alternative instead. Um, that simply means that it's associative for every subalgebra of any two elements. It's also anti-commutative. So x times y will give us minus y times x. Next, we show a simple lemma um, about the norm of x that we proved using the postulates from the previous slide. Um, x, we let x be an octanion and x bar be its conjugate. Now we say that x times x bar is the same as x bar times x, and that is actually the norm of x, which is just a product or a sum of the products of the real parts. Um, this is only a snapshot of a part of the proof because it's actually quite a long proof. And you see that we start by showing x times x bar, but we do have to finish up by showing x bar times x. It gives you the same result. Next, we need the previous result, the norm, to find the form of the inverse of x. And we propose that it should look like x conjugate divided by the norm. Um, we just use a little bit of modern algebra here. Um, you might remember that x times x inverse should give you the identity, and that should give you x inverse times x. And if we divide through by x, we get that x inverse should look like the identity divided by x. And as we usually do with complex and hypercomplex numbers, we go ahead and multiply our result by the octanionic conjugate, and we get that the identity times x bar just gives us back x bar, and the denominator x times x bar is just the norm. Here we take a look at octanionic multiplication. This is the first extension. It is the least intuitive of all the extensions, but it does have some nice properties. It's the most direct extension from the quaternions so that Q1 is actually E1, Q2 is E2, Q3 is E3. And so this first four rows and first four columns actually gives you the table of quaternion multiplication. Now extension two and extension three use cyclic multiplication to define these tables on um, cyclic multiplication with seven from one to seven. Now here we do a simple exploration of a ton of subalgebras and um, substructures. It's very straightforward, um, but it doesn't end up being much use. If we go back, no, we can't go back. Um, we can pick any three elements that are related in some way and create a substructure of them. And if those elements are simply the elements that are extended from the octanions. So for instance, in extension three, if we pick E1, E2, E4, those elements will associate. And so it will give us an algebra that associates, and that algebra will actually just be the quaternion subalgebra. If we pick elements that don't associate, 
this element to just give us back the Antonian, the Antonian algebra. So um, we found this route to be not very, what's the word, illuminated. So we went on to instead look into the properties of some basic elements. Um, we find this very nice theorem, E sub A, E sub B, equal E sub C. Um, if that's true, then E sub 2A, E sub 2B equals E sub 2C. Um, this theorem gave us these two propositions um, when we combined that theorem with um, extension 2 and with extension 3. So we're actually just going to look at one of them. We'll look at the first one because they're very, very similar. We get e sub a, e sub a plus 2 to the n equals e sub a minus 2 to the n plus 1. And so we prove this by mathematical induction since these we're performing induction in n. So these are simply just like recurrent recurrent relations, although Octonians are in an ordered algebra, an ordered set. It's okay to do this because we're looking at this like a recurrent relation. Um, so for the base case, we show here that we, we start with the um, definition of the second extension and we use this theorem right here um, that doubles the subscripts and the basic units but preserves the equation. So we get e sub a, e sub a plus 1 to become e sub 2a, e sub 2a plus 2, and e sub a plus 5 becomes e sub 2a plus 10. Now e sub 2a plus 10, using the idea that e sub a we get e sub a plus 3 because um, 2a becomes a because all elements of c7 are generators so we if we multiply by 2 we're just going to get a back and 10 becomes 3 mod 7 um, that's going to be the same as e sub a minus 4 so we get the desired result e sub a minus 2 to the power of 2 So here we show the associator for three tangents. Um, it's going to be x, y times c minus x times y, z, which will give you two x, y, z, since the tangents aren't associated. Um, for two distinct tangents, the associator is zero, since the tangents are alternative. Um, we would actually get zero for the associator of algebras that are associated right here. Um, finally, we just show um, a property that's a little bit similar to some properties we see with differential forms. Um, when we interchange x, y, z in the associator, when we interchange an even number of elements, we get the sign and change. When we need to change an odd number of elements, the sign changes. Here we just show the Mufon laws, which um, attach more predictability to the Octonians, and we show some conjugation laws. Um, we show the biconjugation law, which is very similar to double negation laws, the product conjugation law, which stems from the anti-commutativity of Octonians. And we show that the norm of x, y is the norm of x times the norm of y. And finally, we show, we give a formula for the associated inner product. Now we define some terms that we're going to need um, to continue. We define an inertial reference frame, it's both called the Lewand's frame to be one for which the first law of class one counts hold. Um, if you don't remember, that is just 
uh, the law that states that a body in which no external forces act either remains at rest or moves with constant speed along a straight line. In the context of relativity, it is one that drifts in gravity-free space without undergoing rotation or acceleration. The, an inertial observer is one that, that is at rest with respect to an inertial reference frame, and we're going to refer to those as the wants observers. The world line of an object is the path it traces in four-dimensional space-time. And the Minoski space-time is just a description of events in four-dimensional space. Um, and we're going to characterize these events by x sub mu. x sub mu consists of one time and three spatial coordinates. x zero is its time coordinates scaled by the speed of light so that it is a distance just like the other coordinates. So now we're going to describe something called an invariant interval. Um, suppose we have two different Lorentz frames, and we're representing the same two events in each frame. So each frame is going to have, let's say the first frame has coordinate x and the difference in x, and the second frame has coordinate y and the difference in y. So clearly these are two different coordinates and two different coordinate differences, but they're going to have the same invariant interval which we usually denote by delta s squared or ds squared um, if we're talking about inf infinitesimally close events. Um, and here we just show the uh, formula for the invariant interval. Um, the negative sign and the dx sub zero squared just represents the fundamental difference between the time coordinate and the spatial coordinates. The negative sign on the, on the left-hand side the one on the ds squared. That just means that for time-like separated events, so where the time coordinate is greater than the sum of the spatial coordinates, we, we're going to see um, a positive invariant interval. And we can get a negative invariant interval, we can also get zero for invariant interval. Now, what is a Lorentz transformation? Um, a Lorentz transformation is simply a linear relation between the coordinates in two different different inertial frames. So we have these two Lorentz frames, S and S prime, and we can describe the coordinates in S in terms of the coordinates in S prime. That's um, the basic idea of what a Lorentz transformation is. And they're usually represented by matrix, by matrices, sorry, um, matrices L. So here, we let eta be your mission two by two of the neuronic matrix, given by this. So if we have mission matrix, it has to be equal to its conjugate transpose. So we see here that the Etonians A, the Etonian A, and right here across from it, we have diagonally across, I guess. We have its conjugate. And then for PM, those are real numbers that P and M are real numbers, and they're A sub 0 plus A sub 9, and A sub 0 minus A sub 9. And that preserves E um, matrix under conjugated transposition. We have analyzed the properties of the tunnels because of the relationship between the symmetries of norm division algebras and supersymmetric theories. Although the Italians lack associativity and commutativity, we were able to find sufficient patterns in their behavior in the Mifflin laws, for instance. Um, and we did focus on the Lorentz transformations here, but Maxwell's equation and the wave equations are good openings, um, good areas that we can extend to present to a neuronic representation. Um, these are the references that we use. Any questions now? Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.